go ahead and get started. We have a a few more people coming in, but um, good afternoon. Hi, I'm Elizabeth King. I'm the Associate Director of the Weiser Center for Europe and Eurasia. I thank you all for coming on this wonderful <laughs> spring day here in Ann Arbor, but um, we have a great um, program for the afternoon, so we'll start with having a presentation by um, um, the Galatis and then followed by presentations by some of the students who went to Albania last summer. And then we'll be followed, we invite you to stay for the reception to ask more questions, to mingle, et cetera. So um, first of all, I want to just mention, I know Tina um, Sula, you're going to talk a little bit more about the Albanian Community Fellowship, but um, just a brief introduction that was started in 2014 by the um, University of Michigan Albanian Student Organization and the Albanian community here in Michigan, and also with some support from the Weiser Center for Europe and Eurasia. And so we'll get to hear some great examples of how that's being put to use, and we have some you know, potential um, stu or students who are potentially going to Albania again this summer to kind of keep that tradition alive and keep this fellowship going. So um, there's also on the table a pamphlet so you can read more information about it. But thank you for those of you who have been supporting it and hopefully we can also encourage other people to also support this um, fellowship for students. Um, so the next thing on our agenda will be to have uh, Michael Galati and Sylvia Desky Galati. They're going to talk about their work in um, Albania. So Dr. Galati is a professor in anthropology. He received his PhD from University of Wisconsin. He's an archaeologist and directs several field projects in Greece and Albania. Um, he has a book on tribal cultures of northern Albania titled Light and Shadow, which won the 2014 SS SAA Book Award. And his most recent book is soon coming out. It's in press, as I understand, called Memory and Nation Building from Ancient Times to the Islamic State. Um, Sylvia Disky Galati is an archaeologist and educator who holds a master's um, degree in anthropology from Michigan State University and has helped to lead and organize field projects throughout Albania, um, where she also is carrying out her PhD research and has directed you know, several groups of students on archaeological um, surveys in the, in the country. So I'm sure we'll hear more details of both of those. So, um, and then... Yes, I think I'll turn it over to the Galatis to start. No, thanks. Well, thank you all for being here on such a beautiful Sunday afternoon. I'm sure we'd rather all be outside enjoying the sun, but um, I'm glad you're here. And uh, so we're, of course, uh, here to celebrate Albania and uh, the Albanian Community Fellowship Program, which you just heard a little bit about. Um, but uh, um, I wanna thank a few people before I get going. Um, first, I'd like to thank Marisha Ostafin, who um, helped set this up. Um, she's been um, a great colleague and friend, and um, we're really happy to be here. Um, I wanna recognize some of the people who helped um, set up the fellowship program, to the best of my knowledge. Um, uh, Tina Sula, who's here somewhere, where's Tina? Thank you again, Tina, for all, all your support of this, uh, this program. Um, Sava Farah couldn't be here. She, I think she's running around in Spain somewhere having a good time. Um, but she sends her regards. I know she supported this program as well, um, both morally and also financially. So I think we owe her a round of applause, even though she's not here. Um, I want to thank the Weiser Center for Europe and Eurasia for, uh, for hosting this um, afternoon and for inviting us to speak, um, and all the staff of the Weiser Center. They've really done a great job. Um, but first and fo foremost, I want to thank, and I know Sylvia wants to thank, the Albanian American Student Organization. You guys are great, and thank you so much for setting this up, and we'll look forward to hearing from some of you um, in a few minutes. So Albanian American Student Organization, thank you. So um, our goal today is to tell you a little bit about the archaeological research we have done in Albania over the last 20 years. Um, and so we're going to review some of those projects. Um, we'll move quickly, so there hopefully, hopefully there will be time for you to ask us some questions afterwards. Um, I'm going to speak first um, for a little bit, and then I'll turn the mic over to Sylvia, and she'll come up and speak. Um, and then I'll come back up to wrap things up. Um, so let's get to the slides here. Um, so we have run um, four field projects in Albania over about 20 years, and we're going to review all of those. Um, the first one is the Malacastra Regional Archaeological Project, which was focused on the Greek colonial city of Apollonia. 
The second one I'll talk about is the Shala Valley Project, which was focused on the high mountains of North Albania. Um, the third project is PASH, the Proyecti Archeologici Skodres, um, which we ran near the city of Skoder, down by uh, Lake Skoder. And then the fourth project we'll talk about is one that is in the um, beginning stages, we'll start this summer, and that's uh, Rapid Kosovo, um, Regional Archeology span in the Peja and Istag, Istag districts of Kosovo. Um, so uh, uh, we'll go through those four projects, one after the other. Um, but before jumping into archaeology, many of you already know this because you've been to Albania or you're from there, um, but some of you won't know this. I want to say that Albania is a beautiful, beautiful place. So if you haven't been and you have a chance to go, you should go. Um, yeah, let's clap for that, right? Okay. Um, so here's the, the mountains of Shala, absolutely gorgeous. Here's the uh, Rugova Valley in Kosovo. Again, beautiful, wonderful place. But lest you think Albania is just mountains, there's also amazing beaches. So if you like the beach, Albania is a great place to go. So um, incredibly beautiful. But also blessed with an amazing cultural heritage um, and an amazing history. Beautiful churches, all right? So here's a, here's a beautiful painted church in Himara. Um, archaeological sites, which we'll talk about more in a minute. This is the hill fort of Gaitan near Skoder. Castles, if you like castles, here's Rosafa Castle in Skoder. Right, but Albania is beautiful. Albania has great archaeology and history, but the best thing about Albania is Albanian people. So if you have a chance to go, you can meet Albanian people. They're the most gracious people in the world. They really live up to the idea of mikpritia, hospitality. Um, so, so if you go to Albania, you'll love meeting Albanian people. And you will be plied with great food, coffee, and of course, raki. So, um, so hopefully you can go to Albania and meet Albanian people. Wonderful families, beautiful families, beautiful people. Great kids, lots and lots of kids. They love seeing foreigners, shaking hands of foreigners. Right, and again, not, I don't want you to think Albania is just villages and mountains and you know, small towns. There's also the wonderful capital of Tirana, which is really a great place now to go. It's a fantastic Mediterranean city. Um, I've never felt more safe than anywhere in Tirana. Um, I take students there all the time. And of course, if you like football, Albanian football, A.S. Shiptar, right? So um, one of the best parties we've ever been to was when um, Albania beat, what was it, Romania in the World Cup? So um, a couple of years ago. So a fantastic place to visit. All right, so that's my plug for Albania. Go to Albania. Um, now let's talk about archaeology. Um, so we'll start with the Malacastra Regional Archaeological Project. This was a project that I ran with colleagues beginning in 1998. Um, we were focused on a Greek colonial city that was established in the 6th century BC um, by Greeks who came and put a city down there um, on the coast of Albania. Um, it was eventually conquered by the Romans. Um, but on top of the site, um, during the Byzantine period, a very beautiful church and monastery were built. So it's a multi-component site. It's a fantastic place to go see and an amazing history. Um, it's one of eight national parks, national archaeological parks, des designated by the federal government in Albania. Um, our goal in working there as archaeologists was to study the interactions between those colonists and the locals, the so-called Illyrian people. Um, we were curious about whether they interacted with one another, um, whether they got along, or, or whether there might have been conflict between them. Um, so we set off to understand these kind of colonial classical relationships between um, the colonists and the indigenous people. Um, but one of the great things about archaeology is when you start doing archaeology in a region, you always find exactly what you didn't expect to find. So on the very first day, we found a big Paleolithic site. So um, this is a beautiful leaf point. Um, and we uh, conducted um, excavation here at this site, Krijata B. 
um, and we found good evidence for, um, for uh, early human, probably Neanderthal occupation in the region of Ap Apollonia beginning about 100,000 years ago. So this was a really exciting find um, that didn't tell us much about colonial interactions between Apollonia and, and the local people. Um, one thing we did was we focused some of our work on the very large burial ground outside the city walls, the so-called necropolis, the city of the dead. Um, and this was a, a, this is a very, very large monument located outside the city that's composed of upwards of about 100 burial mounds, so-called tumuli, where the dead were being interred um, uh, after the foundation of the city. Now this is really interesting for us as archaeologists because um, burial in mounds is very much an Illyrian practice. It's a local practice. It wasn't something Greeks did often um, or very frequently. But the colonists, who were supposedly Greek, right, were putting their dead into these burial mounds um, and then marking them with uh, grave markers that were very much in the Greek tradition. So this grave marker has an Illyrian couple, um, a, a parent and a child, and they're in traditional Illyrian dress, but the epitaph, the, the um, inscription on the gravestone is in Greek. Um, so what we really uncovered was really interesting examples of hybridism, syncretism, um, and interaction um, between uh, the colonists and the local people. Um, but all of this was brought to a screeching halt by the Romans about 229 BC when they conquered most of the Balkans, including Albania um, and including Apollonia. Um, and we uh, investigated this um, process by excavating a small Hellenistic farmstead the period preceding the Roman conquest. Um, and we dug that house and we found um, very good evidence. Um, we radiocarbon dated the site that it was destroyed and burned right around 229 BC. So of course we found lots of nails which would have been used to, to put the house together, but we also found a big iron spear point. So we can kind of imagine the Roman legionnaires marching up to this house and destroying it and burning it. Um, uh, so, um, so really interesting archaeological research. We spent a good five, six years working in this region um, and really found um, lots of interesting archaeology to work with. Um, so, uh, so I really liked working at Apollonia, but I became really fascinated um, about that time, about the end of this project at Apollonia with the north um, and with the high mountains, the Albanian Alps. Um, like many of you, I read Rose Wilder Lane and Edith Durham and, and those other travelers who went to the north. Um, so I made my first trip up there in 2002 and uh, was um, again blown away by the beauty of the place. Um, but uh, but I was also impressed with the hospitality of the people, and I decided that I wanted to run a project there. Um, so we started the Shala Valley Project, um, and our goal was to work um, in uh, uh, in Shala um, as a way of understanding the tribal system of the of the mountain north. Um, North Albania is the only place in Europe, in Southeast Europe um, in particular, where tribal societies survived into the 20th century um, with tribal chiefs and councils, large extended families and large stone houses, unfortunately occasionally blood feuds. Um, so it was a really fascinating place for an anthropologist to work to try and understand where this system came from, how it developed, how it evolved through time, and how it survived um, over time up in the, in the high mountains of North Albania. Um, so is, as near as we can gather, these folks arrived up in the high mountains fleeing the Ottomans. Um, in Shala in particular, um, they were Catholic. Um, and uh, so they had reason um, to flee to the mountains. Um, this process began sometime in the early to late medieval period um, when people arrived and this very unique, um, uh, um, like I said, very interesting tribal system formed. Um, so we can think of these groups, these tribes that are living up in the mountains of North America, uh, North, North America, North Albania, as uh, ref, so-called refuge societies. Um, they're up there defending uh, their turf, hiding out from the Ottomans. Um, and uh, uh, one of the things that uh, they used to structure the system, the tribal system, was a, a, um, an oral, oral customary law code called the Kanun of Lek. Um, and so um, uh, we studied also how the, the Kanun influenced um, the people living there and also the settlement patterns of the region. Um, so what we did was, uh, da, da, da. Uh, so we organized our project. Um, 
we had really good support from the National Science Foundation of the United States and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, we did a planning season in 2004. Um, we did field seasons and seasons in 2005 through 2008. Um, this was a co-directed project that was run by myself and um, colleagues Os Lafe and Zamir Tafalitza. Um, and uh, we did um, work that we referred to as ethno-historic archaeology. Um, so we had teams that were operating um, in Shala throughout the whole valley, um, teams of archaeologists who were doing survey looking for archaeological sites, teams of ethnographers who were interviewing um, locals and especially um, elders um, who weren't getting any older at that point or any younger at that point. Um, we had archival historians um, who were operating in various archives throughout Europe looking for references um, to the region, to Shala. Um, and, uh, and then we did architectural surveys as well, ethno-historic surveys, looking at how people were living in the valley. Um, and so we surveyed all of Shala that way. Um, and uh, we um, had two main goals, to produce a diachronic record of the valley's cultural resources. Um, but like I said, we wanted to understand that tribal system and figure out whether they survived because they were highly isolated and had no contact with the outside world or rather whether they might have interacted um, as needed, and that's how they, um, they were able to be so successful living in the mountains. Um, and we came up with a concept that we called strategic isolationism, where they would, they would deploy isolationism if and when they needed to do it, um, but they also interacted when it made sense to do so as well. And these decisions were all made um, by the tribal councils, by the elders working through the tribal system um, within the bounds of the kanun. Um, and I wanted to point out to you, for those who are interested, that all of our data, all of our photos, all of our interviews, um, all of our, um, our map files, everything is available for free for download from the Archaeological Data Service, which you can find online. So if you want to look at all of our data, or if those students, if you want to use it, it's all there. Um, so it's available. Um, now, again, like I said, just like at Apollonia, um, you set out to do one thing in archaeology, but then you're taken in other directions because you find things you didn't expect. So um, that first season, we actually, at the very end of the village of Theth in North Shala, uh, at the tip of the village, we found an unexpected, unknown, previously undiscovered Iron Age hill fort, late Bronze Age Iron Age hill fort, um, which, again, we didn't think we would, we would expect it to find. Um, so this was a really um, large site that was built right at the tip of this cliff. Um, and the way they made this, uh, this spot usable um, is they redirected a river coming from the waterfall in Theth, and they built very large terraces to do this. Um, and you can see this, this bottom terrace is a good uh, 10 feet tall. So they used very, very large stones. Um, and these terraces in this site um, was built around 1000 BC and used for about 300 years. Um, they were living there. Um, so a really interesting um, uh, archeological site just for how it was built and the uh, effort and the labor that went into it. Um, but uh, also interesting because um, the question then arises, who did this? Why were they there? Why were they living there? How were they living there? Um, and what we think is this hill fort was built to control access and passage through the valley. So people wanting to get from the coast up through the mountains, this was a strategic point, a choke point through the mountains that could be controlled by this hill fort. Um, and so it was worth the time and effort to build, uh, build this. Um, so when we got done with our surveys, we were able to compare the settlement patterns um, from the prehistoric period to the medieval period um, to the modern period. <clears throat> and what we found is that in the prehistoric period, indeed, um, they seem to have been up there to defend themselves. They had a very highly nucleated settlement pattern. So there was a previously known hill fort in South Shala. There was the new one we found at Grunas in North Shala. Um, and people seem to have been living there seasonally, just in the summer with their animals. They brought everything they needed, probably up from the coast, and maintained these, um, these uh, hill forts so they could control trade and movement through the valleys. Um, somewhat similar to the very early, late medieval settlement, the first um, appearance of that tribal system of, of modern peoples in the valley, there was a long hiatus when no one seems to have been living there, probably associated with the Roman conquest. Um, and in the medieval period, it was also pretty uh, nucleated. 
Um, and it was nucleated around Catholic churches. So the church of uh, Shenzhen and Theth, most of the settlement we found evidence for through survey was around that church. Um, but very quickly, right after the influx of people into Shao, a population grew quickly, fast. And it grew extensively throughout the valley. They were terracing things, making land available, building houses. Um, and uh, we think what allowed this to happen really was the appearance of New World crops. They were able to grow things like maize, um, potatoes, right, beans. Um, and if you've been to Albania, you eat a lot of maize, beans, and potatoes, right? Um, so uh, so these, these, they could grow um, these crops in large amounts. They could store it, and this enabled population growth. And so that was another key to helping the, the tribal system survive and grow and develop in North Albania. Um, so all of this work on the Shala Valley Project produced a book um, that you already heard about called Light and Shadow. Um, and uh, there's um, a copy of the book outside the door for those who are interested and want to see it. And the press has extended a really nice discount. So if you want to buy it, you can get, I think it's 20% off or something. So, um, so if you feel like you want to have a copy of the book, now's the time to buy it. Um, so on that note, I'll end and I'll um, hand it over to Sylvia. So thank you all very much. Um, thank you um, for being here today. Um, I'm going to be talking about the next phases of our work in the region. Um, so, having worked in the mountains of northern Albania, we wanted to um, look at the archaeology of Shkodra down by the coastal region of northern Albania. And that facilitated the Projekti Archeologic i Shkodres, or PASH for short, um, this began with the field season in the summer of 2010 and concluded in the summer, or actually winter, of 2014. This project was co-directed with Lawrence Bako at the University of Tirana. This project involved numerous Albanian as well as American students working together and was largely supported by a large grant from NSF. One of the primary research questions we had um, for Posh was the, uh, the question of the seemingly sudden uh, appearance of hill forts, um, fortified sites, um, as well as burial mounds during the, bronze, the early Bronze Age. Was this indeed a sudden emergence, or did this um, phenomenon occur gradually um, through time? Also, was this the result of indigenous development, something that happened from the local uh, people, or was this a practice that was introduced from the outside? Um, one way to begin to answer um, this question was by surveying nearly 30 square kilometers. Um, we found and investigated almost 20 different sites, as well as excavated at three hill forts and four tumuli big mounds. Um, as an example of a hill fort that we um, investigated, um, we carried out excavations at Gaitan Hill Fort um, near Skoder. The traditional interpretation of Gaitan is that it was founded in the Bronze Age, circa 1200 BC. However, we have new radiocarbon dates indicating that Gaitan was indeed founded sometime in the late Neolithic, so pushing that founding time uh, back to about 5000 BC. So settlement of hill forts in Skoder was not in fact a sudden phenomenon, but appears to have happened gradually and starting a lot earlier than previously thought. We of course had great help throughout um, our excavations, um, meet Danny Golotti, future archaeologist in training. He's ours. <laughs> um, let's see here. So this um, Tumulus 99 is one example of the four uh, burial mounds that we excavated during our four years, close to five years working on Posh. Um, so burial mounds in this region were first constructed um, in the early Bronze Age 
However, they were built and rebuilt and used and reused in all kinds of different ways um, for thousands of years. Tumulus 99, for example, pictured here, um, was uh, created sometime during the Middle Bronze Age with a radiocarbon date of about 1900 BC. Um, there is a central tomb located here um, and we excavated the remains of probably at least three individuals, two of whom were adults and one juvenile, perhaps representing a family. We carried out strontium isotope analysis as a means for um, examining the human bone chemistry in order to be able to get at questions about whether these individuals were local or whether they came from elsewhere um, from the region. Um, this strontium isotopic work was done at MIT. And the results that we found, um, at least the initial results we're finding, are that one of the individuals from Tumulus 99 was indeed non-local, meaning they did not have um, bone chemistry that matched the levels that um, one can expect to find um, locally. So this individual perhaps came from elsewhere, possibly the interior, maybe even Kosovo. If you look at the strontium um, rates, they're, they're pretty similar. Um, perhaps this could be representative of a female that migrated into the region. Okay, so we have cameras rolling. We have big news to announce. Um, you're hearing it here for the first time. The results of the first ever ancient DNA analysis uh, we submitted based on two successful DNA extractions from the teeth that we found from uh, Tumulus 99. Um, this DNA work was done at Harvard and uh, we see here the H1 haplogroup represented um, in these individuals, um, which is a very common thing to find in southeastern Europe, thus linking prehistoric Albanians to the rest of the region. One male um, that we know of, and there is more extensive um, analysis currently um, underway. This will ultimately determine the relationship of their DNA to all other ADNA in the Reich lab, which carries DNA samples from all over Europe from all time periods, and might also indicate whether the indi other individual was a female and whether the juvenile was indeed their child. More results and interpretations um, are forthcoming as POSH will be published soon um, by Michigan's Museum of Anthropological Archaeology Press. So while we are um, busy forthcoming with um, the results of the POSH book, um, we are starting a new project called Rapid Kosova. So here we're looking at um, routes um, from Albania all leading to Kosovo. Having looked at the plains and the mountains, now we'd like to study the plateau, the Dugajin Plateau of Western Kosovo in order to gain a larger comprehensive view of the larger region to see how these various components of the region fit together. To this end, we have a new project beginning this summer based in Peja, just on the other side of the mountainous north of Albania and in collaboration with the Kosovo Institute of Archaeology. We aim to survey the Peja and Istog districts, the first such large-scale systematic surveys in the country. We know where the large sites are, including the prehistoric hill forts and burial mounds, However, the most interesting aspect and one that is different from North Albania are the large complex Neolithic sites characterized by large humanoid figurines. One such, one such site in our study region um, as we see here and we hope to find and document more. Turning it back over to Mike to wrap things up. Thank you.
so I just want to end um, here for us um, <clears throat> by acknowledging uh, once more the fantastic work that's been done um, in Ann Arbor, in Detroit, by the Albanian American community. Um, we recently had the great pleasure of attending the George Castriotti Scholarship Fund Gala. Um, this group raises money um, for scholarships for Albanian American students. Some might be here um, at this talk. Um, and so uh, the Albanian American community has, has done a fantastic job um, uh, raising money for Albanian students. Um, and of course we have the Albanian Community Fellowship Fund as well that is sending students to Albania. Um, when we got here we were struck by um, uh, the energy that already existed here around Albania and Albanian studies. And we now think it's time um, to look to the future and found an Albanian studies program at Michigan. Um, so Sylvia and I and others in this room have already began, begun uh, laying the groundwork for such a program um, to include Albanian language study but also study of Albanian history um, and literature and Albanian culture. Um, I, I do truly believe uh, Albania has had a huge impact on my life. Albanian people have had a huge impact on my life. I'm a married one. Um, and, uh, um, and I think it's time to, to share that, um, that culture and that history um, with the world. Um, and there is no such real Albanian studies program in the United States um, quite like that. So I think now is the time to do it. Um, and this won't be easy. It'll take time um, and it'll take hard work. Um, but um, if I know anything about Albanians, it's that they're willing to work hard. So, um, so hopefully we can see um, sometime soon an Albanian studies program at Michigan. Um, with that, I'm going to turn over the mic to our student speakers. Um, thank you all very much for um, taking the time to listen. Um, and uh, we'll talk more um, after. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, it's so wonderful to see all of you today. Um, when I started the University of Michigan in 2004, I think I found seven Albanians. So there were seven of us that uh, met together for coffee. So to be here today and to see all of you and to see all this progress, like I'm amazed and inspired. So, so thank you so much for, for all of your support. So uh, my name is Tina Sula, and I am the former Director of International Giving and Engagement um, at the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts. So when I uh, was here at Michigan, my job was to travel all around the world and to uh, connect and reconnect with uh, Michigan alumni. So my job, of course, was to raise money, uh, but the part of my job that I really, really loved was connecting Michigan students with internship opportunities all around the world. So I remember um, sending students, you know, because of these connections to um, really amazing places, but I never got to send students to Albania. So I had two motivations. My first motivation was that when I was a, a graduate student getting a degree in a public policy, uh, an internship was required. So I said to myself, I, after I graduate with this degree, I'm gonna be a, a full-time adult and I'm gonna go work, so I probably will never have the opportunity again to, to give back in a meaningful way. And this was my chance to go to Albania. But uh, I didn't get that opportunity. Nobody offered me an internship. Um, I found another internship, but um, that experience really uh, stayed with me. So when uh, I was this uh, um, fundraiser going abroad and working very closely with Marisha uh, at the Weiser Center, I was liaison to the International Institute, I saw that there were uh, donors and alumni who were you know, who were giving money to support regional studies, you know, Greek studies, Armenian studies, Brazilian studies, you name it. And after a couple of years, I said, well, we really need to have Albanian studies too, or at least we need to send students to Albania. So it was 2013 when we decided to start a pilot. And this pilot was uh, three students. So we have Kledia Jelila and we have Ayona Korchari, and then the third student is in New York right now. But they said, yes, we want to go to Albania, so let's see what we can make happen. So they went to Albania. They had an amazing experience. They're nodding, so... Okay, <laughs> um, so when they came back, we went to, to LSA, we went to Wiser, and we said, you know, can we, can we grow this program? 
So they were a little, you know, at LSA, they were like, oh, I don't, I, we don't know. I don't know if there is any interest uh, in Albania. But in 2014, we sent 16 students to Albania, Kosovo, and the region. We sent more students to Albania and Kosovo than any other country. Um, and some of these students are here today, and these are the students who you are going to hear from today. I, I studied uh, political science, I studied public policy, like I mentioned, and I believe that international ex uh, experiences change lives, and I, and I see some people nodding. Um, when you go abroad, you get to figure out who you really are, um, and when you go to a place like Albania, as Michael mentioned, you know, you get to experience hospitality, you get to, to see a country, um, and when we send some of these students, and I'm thinking of one in particular, an international student from China, Beijing, hi. <laughs> she got to see Albania from top to bottom. And I was so amazed from the picture she sent and from her confidence. So, so I know that these experiences do change lives. And I want to um, I want to thank all of you guys for, for being here and for wanting to, to support these students. Um, in 2014, the president of Albania came here to the University of Michigan, and Albana Shehai is here today, and she helped uh, make that visit possible. So it was at that time, with having 15 or 16 students go to Albania, we said, well, we really need to have an endowment. We need to have money so that we can continue to, to support these experiences. So that's how we started the Albanian Community Fellowship Program. And then I left uh, the University of Michigan in 2015, so I'm no longer in that role. But uh, Marisha and the Weiser Center, and Gita in particular, who, who runs the program, are continuing to support students to this day. So I have, a, I have a small ask of you guys. So that first ask is that if you have connections in Albania, please connect with Gita, because we're always looking to find meaningful opportunities for students. And the second ask is I hope that you will continue to uh, support this program financially. I remember from being a gift officer that it's about $2,000 that encourages a student to either pursue an international experience or not pursue that international experience. So I think if all of us chipped in just small amounts, you know, we can change uh, the lives of, of these students one at a time. Um, the College of LSNA has been really supportive. The Weiser Center has been extremely supportive. Um, and all the other schools, departments, and units continue to support these students. So I hope that, um, you know, when you see the, uh, the booklet in front of you, that you'll take it and, you know, you will send it a check-in, so always a fundraiser. So now, I want to uh, introduce the two students uh, who want to share about their experience and how that experience changed their lives. So the first student is Amanda Uikashi. Uh, she interned at the Federata Ship Federata Shiptare Futbolik. Foshusha, which is the Albanian uh, Soccer Federation. So when Albania came uh, to the group, there was a few of us Albanians who were working actually in the development office to trying to support these students. She said that she was majoring in athletic training. So we tried to connect her with an opportunity that would be meaningful to her. And it was actually somebody in the Albanian community here that uh, helped her find that internship. So Amanda will, uh, will uh, share her experience. And then Hanna Berishe, um, who is studying international studies, will also talk about her experience experience at European Movement uh, Albania. So I want you guys to give a round of applause to all these students, um, and I want you to give a round of applause to, the, to Marisha and Gita and everyone at the Weiser Center, because without them it would not be possible. Amanda? Okay. Okay, um, first I would like to thank everyone for coming out and supporting the Weiser Center and the Albanian American Student Organization. We wouldn't be anywhere without all of your support. Um, as a soon-to-be graduate, I've been reflecting a lot on my experiences at the University of Michigan and how they've helped shape me into who I am today. I've been very fortunate to have exceptional mentors, challenging classes, and rewarding experiences that I know have helped prepare me for the steps in my journey following. Um, one of the most long-standing being a member of the Albanian Club on campus. Entering my freshman year, I just moved back, from, um, moved back to the United States and was very nervous about finding friends and navigating pre-med requirements and getting uh, the most out of my college experience. So joining the Albanian Club, they really helped me get on my feet and um, became my second family at Michigan. Uh, more than just studying together, they would help me pick classes. Uh, we would volunteer together and we really became like best friends. 
So when I heard that I could volunteer or intern in Albania um, with my best friends, I jumped at the opportunity. Uh, the summer following my freshman year, I lived in Tirana for two months, and I was an intern at the Albanian national soccer team. Um, being one of the only interns there, um, because they didn't really know what interns was at the beginning, um, I was very hands-on um, on several different projects, um, including promoting uh, uh, female and children in inclusion in sport. Um, so some of the projects that we came up with and initiatives that we started were including um, women's only tournaments and primary school sports days. And we actually got UEFA funding to manifest these projects, so that was really cool to be um, in connection with such a large uh, organization. Um, and these assignments helped me develop relevant skills that I still, still use and have used since. Um, but I think probably the most uh, meaningful part of my experience, um, besides working at such a prestigious institution, was that I grew as a person. Um, I was born in the United States, and I'm not an, a native Albanian speaker, so like sometimes I would feel disconnected from my cultural identity and heritage. Um, and like I would go back and visit Montenegro, um, Ulcin, where my family is from, but we never really went outside of that. So this was the first time I had been in Tirana for such a long time, um, or outside of Albania for such a, or Montenegro for such a long time. So during this internship, I was able to live and work in Albania and practice my speaking and take lots of coffee breaks and travel <laughs> from Škodra to Saran. And I was even able to volunteer at a medical clinic in Pogradets where I could take vitals and talk to patients. So I thought this experience gave me like a lot of beautiful memories and a strong sense of pride for my Albanian blood. And so I'm really thankful to Wiser for like letting this be possible for me. Um, when I received the scholarship from Wiser, um, I went with six other members of the Albanian club and we were able to develop professionally and as individuals. And we're extremely grateful to the Wiser Center for affording us this opportunity and I hope that they can continue to support students as they supported us in the future. Hi everyone, I'm Hannah Barishai. I'm a junior here and I'm majoring in political science and international studies. And this past summer I interned at European Movement Albania through the Wiser Center. Um, I was their first ever American intern, so they kind of didn't know what to do with me for a while, but we figured it out. And so I did a lot of work engaging with them and engaging with local Albanian students and professors and professionals. Um, the organization primarily worked in researching um, in research related to regional and domestic policy centered around Albania's accession to the European Union and its own progress in democracy, good governance, and economic sustainability. Um, while at European Movement Albania, I helped conduct outreach events with universities and professors. I um, researched grants that the university or that the organization could apply for and more. Um, so traveling to Albania this past summer wasn't just about my professional goals and experience, but it was also very personal for me. Um, both of my parents are from Montenegro and they're Albanians and like Amanda, I went back a couple years ago but I'm not a native speaker and so I had this kind of cultural disconnect that I really wanted to work on exploring more and it was really a cultural like immersion for me even though that was immersion was sometimes like waiting for a cow to like move past the road so we could keep driving or not getting chased by a chicken again. Um, it was really a, a enlightening experience that I really cannot have done without the support from the Wiser Center financially and personally. Um, the funds that they provided to me, as well as contributing to my professional experience there, helped me see family members that I hadn't seen for over a decade. And I remember working one day, I'm a work study there as well, and Marisha actually came up to me and she asked me, how much do you need minimum to do this? And I told her, and she said, okay. And a few weeks later, she, I got my um, reward letter and she asked me if it was enough, and I was like really, inspired by the dedication that she had for us as Albanian students and for me personally and the action she would really take to make our dreams possible and really help us go and intern and have this kind of experience. Um, so I hope that you're all able to recognize through this whole event and my personal story and Amanda's personal story, the commitment that the Wiser Center has to Albanian studies and continue to support them, whether it be coming to events like this donating money or just signing up to our email list and just showing that kind of support. And that would really help other students like me and American students um, intern in Albania and Kosovo and other Eastern European countries and continue to grow personally and professionally. 
So thank you so much for taking the time to come here and listen to our stories and Professor Galati. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you to the Galatis for your presentation and thank you for the students as well. So we'd like to invite you to join us for the reception and hopefully an opportunity to ask questions, et cetera. Yes. Maybe you need to come. We don't have a portable microphone, but would you like to come here so people can hear? Okay, can you hear, is this better? Um, my name's Frances Trix, and just to give you a little historic background, I was a doctoral student 30 years ago, and I, I love Albanian culture and people. And I was trying to do work in Albanian, as I said, 30 years ago, and nobody had heard of Albanian anything at Michigan. So this is such a wonderful change, just to let you know, uh, again, Americans couldn't go to Albania 30 years ago, so I wanted to go to Kosovo to study Albanian. And I'd studied with Albanian immigrant community in Detroit, which was wonderful. But the only way I could get over there was to go interview at Princeton <coughs> in IREX, and I got the, I, I won, I got the interview. This is 1987, 88, so I go over there. This is the time of Milosevic. I got picked up by the secret police. It was a very interesting time. Um, it was very interesting. It changed my life. Talk about international travel changing your life. I was doing a doctorate in linguistics and I became an anthropologist because this was the time that Yugoslavia was falling apart and of course it was falling apart most clearly in Kosovo. I mean, you could see it. the Serbian police were all over. And I came back to Ann Arbor and I told my professors here, I said Yugoslavia is falling apart and it's going to come to pieces in Kosovo, and they said, where's Kosovo? <laughs> so to come to see this with students going, undergraduates going, people coming together is just wonderful, so I am so impressed. <laughs>